What's up, my friend? My name is André Joel be reacting to How did America become a superpower after World War II? But before I go into that, can I ask you for one thing? If you can leave a like on this video, thank you so much for that. It's the best way to show support. If you can subscribe, oh man, forget about it. You make my day. Have that in consideration. Now, link for the original video in my description, but let's not waste any time. You guys end up recommending this one quite a lot, so let's play it. It's morning in America. All mm. over the newly built suburbs, men who just months earlier were fighting in Europe or Asia are climbing into their cars and heading to work. Okay. In the cities, returning veterans crowd lecture halls at universities and colleges, receiving advanced educations they never thought, thought possible. And, and all on Uncle Sam's dime. Okay, I feel like there will be some dark twist uh, on this video. Let's see it. Manufacturing booms under a tsunami of private investment. The lean times of the Great Depression fading from memory as stores are flooded with a bevy of American-made appliances, gadgets, and goods. And abroad, American servicemen keep watch over lands from Cuba to Korea. A new world has come into being. An American one. Okay. So before we even go in, into the, the reasons why America became a superpower after World War II, I ended up studying this on school, uh, as you guys can imagine. And as far as I remember, the main reason is basically Europe was completely destroyed and the American economy was doing very well. And you guys also end up uh, giving a lot of money to, to Europe. Uh, of course, that uh, end up in the long run generating a lot of money to, to America. But I don't think it's only that. I also think that people end up uniting. I feel uh, there was a lot of innovation and... Basically, a lot of things uh, play out very well. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Hi. Historian. In today's video, we will examine how the United States went from an isolationist democracy uninterested in world affairs to one of the two superpowers spreading their influence around the world. Okay, For actually that, that's what I'm more interested about because I know at one point Americans did, did not even want war and nowadays they are the, the number one uh, superpower even in terms of military in the world. First, we'll look at the effects that entering the Second World War had on the American economy. Next, we'll look at how America placed herself in a preeminent position in the post-war world. And okay. lastly, we'll take a look at the political maneuvering, economic luck, and the cloak and dagger exercises it took to get there. So mm. now, let's look at where America was before entering the Second World War. Okay. The stock. Wait, $100 will buy this car, must have cash lost all on the stock market. Oh yeah, this was the, the big crash. Stock market crash of 1929 and the resulting Great Depression were especially hard on the United States. Okay, before you put in the comments I post too much, I'm already aware. But uh, actually, I for some reason I never thought about this. It's crazy that America had to deal with this crazy crash. And a couple of years after that, became the 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 number the number one country in the world it's actually a great great uh it's almost inspiring if you think about um, america is great like like i said a couple of times but uh, it really is in a desperate attempt to revitalize the economy president herbert hoover signed the 1930 smoot hawley tariff act mm. which raised customs duties to such an extent that imported goods became unaffordable to all but the wealthiest Americans. Instead of spurring domestic purchasing and production as intended, the Smoot-Hawley tariffs succeeded only in further damaging the world's economy. Okay, I know I post much, but I have to read it. Went to the job, family man, age 44, best... Okay. Yeah, so a lot of unemployment. Economy. As other nations passed retaliatory tariffs against American exports, international trade plummeted by 65%, leading to the full collapse of banks in America and Europe, as the world economy only increased its tailspin. Dark times. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president in 1933, he immediately set about implementing his New Deal program to strengthen America's economy and get people back to work. 
Bianchi insured Americans' bank accounts through the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, implemented mm. the Social Security program to provide income to the disabled and elderly, and brought thousands onto the federal payroll through public works projects. Okay, that was amazing by Roosevelt, right? Can we, can we all agree with that? That was fantastic. I mean, ensuring your money is protected, social uh, type of, uh, you know, social care almost. I, I like that. While these programs certainly benefited countless Americans, the effects of Roosevelt's New Deal paled in comparison to those of America joining the Second World War. Okay. With the sleeping giant awakened, the United States oh saw a tectonic shift in economic activity, between the draft and the industrial sector experiencing a massive demand for new laborers to produce war material, unemployment plummeted overnight. America's women also stepped into the breach, taking jobs traditionally reserved for men. Government contract. Okay, that's amazing. So America... Uh end up using because at the time i guess we all know this that the humans are are not uh, we are not uh, looked as equal to men when it comes to labor but uh, seems like america was like no no <laughs> women will also build this country i love this great great stuff Tracts and investment spurred continued growth and america's economy roared back yeah. to life through victory in 1945 Arguably, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki marked a new chapter in American history. The isolationist America of old perished in the nuclear holocaust that ended the Second World War. The United States was the only allied country to emerge from the war with her economy not only intact, but thriving. See? As government contracts ended and subsidies were withdrawn, private investment took their place. Consumers were able to purchase goods and appliances that had long been outside of their economic reach, and they used their new economic power to spur more and more spending and growth. This okay, America was doing really, really well after the, the war. I mean, that, that's amazing. Transition from a war economy to a consumerist one was the bedrock of yeah. America's post-war preeminence. But none of it would be possible without the influx of working age men coming home from the war, ready to start their new lives in this revitalized country. Returning GIs stepped off their boats, planes, and trains to find an America totally different from the one they had left. Many would remember the mistreatment their fathers and grandfathers had endured after the First World War, when they were given a pittance of a bonus and a train fare home. But things would be different this time. Okay, that's what matters. The GI Bill of Rights was signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1944 and promised myriad benefits to returning veterans, from federal guarantees on home loans to subsidized university or vocational education. Between 1944 and 1956, 7.8 million veterans went to college or trade schools with GI Bill subsidies, while 2.4 million home loans were guaranteed by the Veterans Administration. Okay, I mean, this is amazing stuff, right? I mean, President uh, Roosevelt, amazing president. Uh, can we all agree with that? At least looking at what I know so far. But great, great stuff by, by him. Um, actually, not that I don't think this is relevant at all, because if you are a great president, you are a great president. But was, was a, rep a Republican or a Democrat? Because I, I'm kind of curious because of all the, the social um, laws that he ended up putting uh, at this time. But great stuff so far. These loans were used to buy houses in the newly built suburbs, where a plethora of new single-family homes drew people from the cities to these new developments. This okay. was the start of American car culture, and the suburban population began commuting from their new homes to their new jobs in the cities on the new interstate highway system. Life was good in the new America, yeah. but there were many excluded from oh, this no. newfound prosperity. Black veterans faced a brand new war on the home front. Their first battle was obtaining GI benefits. One of the key compromises that ensured the original law's passing was the condition that aid be administered by state governments rather than a federal agency. 
This meant that segregationist Jim Crow laws overshadowed the promises of the GI Bill and aid was... Man, that's so sad. Come on, they, they end up fighting for the country like, like the others. And uh, even more important, they are equal to, to, to us. We are all human at the end of the day. Man, this, is a, this makes me a bit sad, honestly. ...was often contingent on skin color. Separate but unequal schools set what few black veterans were able to use their benefits up for failure. While the majority were simply intimidated into never collecting what they were due. Black unemployment was also endemic throughout the 1950s and 1960s what with what work that was available paying only the smallest of wages and offering no chance for upward mobility. America's women found themselves in a battle of their own. Hired in droves to fill the factories and provide support for the armed services, in the minds of many, the end of the war meant the end of Rosie the Riveter. They were laid off en masse from their wartime jobs to make no way for- No chance. Why? I mean, this is them. I'm sorry. But why do this? They didn't... Oh, man. Okay. Now I'm getting a bit triggered by the video, but... Look, I, I love America, but come on, women end, end up being so crucial to, to, to put America in that position. Why now la laying them off? This makes no sense. I, the only reason I can imagine is maybe uh, the government or something end up thinking that if you guys put uh, um, all the ladies uh, at home again, uh, to grow, grow up children, I don't know, uh, because I assume you guys need the workforce. For returning service. But they are also workforce, so I don't get it. Servicemen and those who were kept on the payroll were placed in part-time clerical jobs with no union protections. Women in uniform were denied GI Bill benefits outright, and magazines began running ads and opinion pieces designed to pressure America's women to leave the workforce and settle down as homemakers. This was the dawn of the nuclear family, and... I mean, don't get me wrong. If if uh, a woman wants to stay at home, feel free, I mean. But I think the option should be the, 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 the human, not, you know, others forcing the, the woman to, 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 to do that. That's just bad. The beginning of the baby boom, and America asked its women to do a different kind of duty. Okay, that makes a, uh, some sense, at least, uh, because... Even though it's not a great argument, but at least I, I can see what was the, the training thought. With its domestic house in order, the United States began to make changes abroad as well. In July of 1944, the United States invited representatives of the Allied Nations to Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, where the U.S. Treasury Department proposed an international bank and trade control network to promote worldwide cooperation and prevent the economic brinkmanship that led the world to war. And with that, the International Monetary Fund was born. But this was only a preamble to a much greater effort at American international influence. President Not. Roosevelt believed the world needed a strong international body to prevent future conflict, and such a body would need strong leadership, in his view, American leadership. Roosevelt gathered representatives of the United States, United Kingdom, Soviet Union, and Republic of China at Dumbarton Oaks, a historic residence outside of Washington, D.C., and from August to October of 1944, they laid the groundwork for the United Nations. One year later, on October 24, 1945, the UN was officially established in San Francisco. Honoring the wishes of his predecessor, President Harry S. Truman personally signed the U.S. Charter for the United States and pressured Congress to ratify it. Okay. I mean, President Roosevelt did a lot of things right. Um, even though the, a couple of things there, I'm not sure what he, he was thinking about, but uh, I mean, a lot of things... Uh, and I've been, I mean, NATO is so important today, so... But America had more than economic and political means to promote her interests. The U.S. never truly demobilized, and she was unafraid to use her military might or shadowy intelligence service to spread her influence. The only hmm. roadblock to that influence, in America's view, was communism. The Soviets had already reorganized much of Eastern Europe after the war. Okay, so this, this basically started the, the Cold War with Russia. 
and were busy converting these new socialist republics into buffers between them and the rest of the world. Through investment in the Marshall Plan and propaganda coups like the Berlin Airlift, America sought to combat Soviet influence on the PR front while simultaneously putting her thumb on the scales of elections in the newly created post-war states and elsewhere. On the Asian front, America was busy rebuilding the shattered empire of Japan into a bulwark against the Red Spread in East Asia. On September 8, 1951, the Empire of Japan and the United States signed the Treaty of San Francisco, which officially ended the state of war between Japan and the US. That's good. One of the core tenets of the treaty was Japan's total disarmament, with Japan ceding land and resources for the establishment of American garrisons, some of which still stand today. Japan submitted to the US military government, and the Americans were quick to punish the former empire for its pre-war militarism, demobilized I mean, Japan had no alternative, to be honest. Officers of the Imperial Army were barred from certain occupations, such as government service, while the wealthy landowners who supported the war had their property seized by the Americans and redistributed to tenant farmers. But America mm. had more discreet ways of getting what she wanted. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the CIA undertook a bevy of covert operations throughout the world in support of American foreign policy. The CIA fomented, supported, or outright incited numerous coups and regime changes throughout the post-war years. American support for the vehemently anti-communist regimes of South Korea and South Vietnam is well known, but CIA-backed revolutions also occurred in Iran in 1953 and Guatemala in 1954, among many others worldwide. Okay, so the, the idea that I, I have, and uh, again, just my perspective, I think after the, the World War II, America, America realized, yeah, we can fight all the wars and we most of the time, or at least actually all the time at this point, will be to totally fine. And um, yeah, they started expanding a bit more and realizing, yeah, we basically run the world or military. So yeah, that... Uh, we are kind of the police of, of, of the world. And look, I'm, I'm realistic on this. I, I'm happy that uh, was America taking this job because uh, if it was another country, uh, man, I'm not sure how the world would be today. You, you may not like everything America did, but America overall, I think, did a great job. The 1953 Iranian coup saw the CIA install... And look, I know this is an unpopular opinion among Europeans, to, to be honest, but it's the, the, the one I have. Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The CIA accomplished this by bribing, among others, Iranian clergy who spoke out against the previous government. The same clergy who would go on to speak out against the Shah Pahlavi and incite the Iranian revolution of the 1970s. Uh the 1954 Guatemala coup saw both the CIA and the U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala, John Purifoy, support and direct a military overthrow of Guatemala's democratically elected government in favor of a hardline anti-communist dictatorship under President Castillo Armas. While the CIA would come to judge the Armas regime as inept, despite holding near absolute power, the heads of the agency quietly congratulated each other on a job well done. This was reflective of the CIA's modus operandi, the suppression of democracy to ensure the suppression of communism. Between the areas occupied by her military and her existing possessions, America emerged from the Second World War a territorial giant. The U.S. Yeah. established an empire spanning from Alaska to Hawaii, from Berlin to Tokyo. With her economic growth, sudden territorial breadth, and willingness to use any means to ensure her position, America had cemented itself as the new superpower on the proverbial block. The eagle had landed. Okay. Amazing video. Let's see if there is something more. America was forever changed by the Second World War. Spared the chaos and destruction of fighting on her own soil, America was able to take her war economy into the post-war world, becoming a manufacturing juggernaut and calling the tune of international trade. The GI Bill created an educated exactly. middle class, but its unequal implementation left both black and female veterans to fend for themselves in the resurgent United States. And with clandestine efforts all around the 
Okay, sorry for another pause. The, that's the only bad thing about this video was was that you know is is not a small thing to be honest. But uh, other than that, America was operating amazing. I feel like globe, America was able to affect regime change wherever it deemed necessary, overturning elections and installing sympathetic governments to further her foreign policy goals. America had become an empire to dwarf any throughout history. What an amazing video. Oh man, I enjoyed this one so much. Please leave a like if you also end up enjoying this one. And if you leave a like, I assume you guys would love more content, more content similar to, to this one. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys would enjoy, for example, reactions to World War II, but just not focusing only in America. Also, uh, for example, Germany, the, 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 the perspective on, on their side. Because I think that that would also be quite quite interesting to to react uh, slash learn. Uh, so yeah, do not forget to leave a like, my friends. Really enjoyed this one. Uh, subscribe, leave a comment, all the good stuff. See you guys next time. Bye, my friends.